our next goal is going to be to get from the sort of basic complex functions that we've been looking at, which have just been kind of polynomial functions, just powers of z, right? We want to get from those kinds of functions to the more interesting functions that we study in the secondary curriculum, specifically transcendental functions like the logarithms and trig functions and exponential functions. So how are we going to do that? Well, the road to getting toward those transcendental functions leads us through a re-examination of what the polar expression of a complex number really is and what it does. So let's recap what we learned first about the arithmetic of complex numbers as it relates to the polar expression of those numbers. So one of the most important things that we picked up when we studied the arithmetic of complex numbers had to do with the polar expression, which we, if we just sort of use this convenient notation r angle theta to kind of express the modulus, the distance from the origin in the complex plane, and the argument, the angle with the positive real axis. We'll just write that for the moment as r angle theta. And its rectangular expression is r cosine theta plus i times r sine theta. This is exactly the complex plane analog of converting between rectangular and polar coordinates in the Euclidean xy plane. Right? So if I just write r angle theta as a shorthand for that, then remember the important thing that we observed about complex numbers and how the arithmetic of complex numbers relates to this polar form. If I am to multiply two complex numbers, what happens to the moduli of those complex numbers? How does it relate to the modulus of the product? And what happens to the argument of those complex numbers? How does it relate to the argument of the product? And so this is the arithmetic that you did a few weeks ago, that if I have r angle theta and capital R angle capital theta, and I multiply those out, I end up doing you know, a bunch of distributive property nonsense on this, right? FOIL, if you like to use that word, which many teachers do not. Um, and when I do that, I notice, first of all, that every term in my product is going to have a little r times big R. And so I'm going to factor that out and just focus on how the cosines and sines of the thetas multiply together. So anytime I'm multiplying two complex numbers like this, I like to ask myself, well, what products are going to give me something real and what products are going to give me something purely imaginary? And what I notice here is that the two products that are going to give me something real are the product of the first terms, so cosine little theta times cosine of big theta, and also the product of the second terms, i times sine of little theta times i times sine of big theta. But when those i's multiply together, they're going to give me a real number. That's why that product gives me something real. But i times i is going to give me a negative one. So we're going to get a minus sign here. So the real part of my answer is going to have cosine theta times cosine big theta minus sine theta times sine big theta. What about the imaginary part? Well, that's going to come from my cross terms, uh, the product of my outers and my inners. So I'll get cosine theta times sine of big theta from one of them, and also sine of little theta times cosine of big theta from the others. And we're not going to get a minus sign in this case because we're never multiplying an i by another i. So we're going to get sine theta cosine big theta plus cosine theta sine big theta. And you might, as you did several weeks ago when we did this exercise, look at this real part and this imaginary part and say, I've seen those formulas somewhere before. Where we've seen those formulas is we've seen them as the addition identities for cosine and sine, respectively. So when you learn trigonometric identities, these this is one of the first trigonometric identities that, that you learn in the high school curriculum. So cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine is just another name for the cosine of the sum. And sine, cosine, plus cosine, sine, that's the addition identity for sine. And so that's another name for the sine of the sum. And so what we find out is that the product of these two complex numbers can be rewritten in terms of a new modulus, which is the product of the old moduli, little r times big R, and a new argument. But this new argument is not the product of the old arguments. It's the sum of those old arguments. So in other words, r angle theta times big R angle big theta is r times big R angle little theta plus big theta. So the summary to this right, is when complex numbers multiply, the moduli multiply. So the distances from the origin are going to multiply together. So if I have a complex number that's five units away from the origin multiplied by a complex number that's two units away from the origin, the product is going to be 10, five times two units away from the origin. But the arguments don't multiply. The arguments add. So I just realized as I was making this video for the first time today that this is an alliteration. Moduli multiply. Arguments add.
So if I multiply a complex number that makes a 45 degree angle with the positive real axis by another complex number that makes a 30 degree angle with the positive real axis, the, their product is going to make a 45 plus 30, 75 degree angle with the positive real axis. So we might be inclined to think to ourselves, what else do we know of in our mathematical training that adds when numbers are multiplied? This is the key observation which is going to get us to the root of what the polar form of a complex number really is. What is a better way to understand the relationship between rectangular and polar forms for complex numbers that makes full use of the arithmetic of the complex plane that we wouldn't have had access to if we were just doing the real xy plane in the high school curriculum? What else do we know of that adds together when numbers are multiplied? That would be exponents. So when you're learning the properties of exponents in the high school curriculum, one of the first properties of exponents that you learn is if I'm multiplying two exponentials that have the same base, when I multiply them together, that base is going to carry through, but the exponents are going to add. And so multiplication of two powers, as long as the base is common, leads to addition of their exponents. So we might be led to surmise that that feature of complex numbers which adds together might be an exponent somehow. So here's what we guess. Because the arguments add, we're going to put theta as an exponent with some base. We don't know what that base is. That's going to be the subject of the next video. But since the moduli multiply, those moduli, the r's, are probably not part of the exponent. They're probably a coefficient down here in front of the base. So that when I multiply, two complex numbers. If I can express them both in this exponential format as r times b to the theta and big R times b to the big theta, that if I were to multiply those together, what I would expect to happen is that the little r and the big r would end up multiplying together, but that the little theta and the big theta, because we're multiplying two powers of a common base, would add. And that would give us the expression little r times big r angle little theta plus big theta. So this proposal, what mathematicians sometimes call an ansatz, if they're feeling particularly fancy, it's a German word that sort of means hypothesis, but it means kind of a, it has the connotation of a motivated hypothesis, right? We're not just guessing randomly. We have good reasons to believe that we might be able to do this. And this ansatz seems pretty promising because it makes complex numbers multiply in the way that we just observed the complex numbers do with respect to their modulus and their argument. And so the big question we have to answer in the next video is if this is true, we first of all need these two bases, the b's here, to be the same b. We have to have the same base so that we can get the exponents to add. If we have different bases, then even the high school properties of exponents would tell us we can't just add the exponents. So the big question is what is b? How do we figure out what base we ought to have in order to express a complex number as its modulus times something raised to the power of its argument? So that's where we go in our next video. And I hope you'll stay tuned because the reveal that happens when we discover B is one of the watershed discoveries in the theory of complex numbers. So you definitely want to stay tuned for the next video after this one.